Hey, I thought it would be fun to discuss kind of the generations of cameras of Sarek. I'd, I've got all of them except for Sarek 1, which is basically the Sarek 2, Sarek 3 camera, very similar. But anyway, I uh, thought we'd have a little bit of fun just kind of talking about all of them, some nuances about each one. And if anybody's out there that's still looking to learn about the blue camera, or red camera, I still speak that language really, really well. In fact, just some Sarek trivia, I wrote the basic training for the blue camera years ago. So anyway, uh, I've got some uh, good thoughts on that. But let's get into the cameras. The uh, <clears throat> first one that I've ever owned was uh, the red camera, the Sarek, Sarek 3 system. And just awesome. I, I loved this thing when I got it. It was like the greatest new little toy. And what did you know? You didn't know anything different, but we had to, we had to use powder and we actually had to use a lot of it. And what I loved about the Sarek system back there when I first got it, I bought, I bought Sarek early 2003, somewhere around February, I think it was. I can't, can't remember exact month, but I love doing partial coverage restorations and being able to not have an impression and, you know, finalize the restoration while the anesthetic was still there. You know, all, all the advantages to it was a lot of fun. But I, I look at this case and there's some kind of wacky little partial coverages there. That was a lot of work. And, you know, you didn't know anything different back then, but I do now. I mean, with the prime scan. I'd be able to knock those out pretty quickly, but uh, back then there was a lot of work. And, and for those that had the red camera, you remember that we could only image a certain length, like in the computer just started bogging down. And so this was about as far as you could go. You'd probably go a little bit farther, but that was probably about, I don't know, probably guess four or five, maybe six images. And we had to overlap them at least 30% to get the uh, images to uh, stitch. But uh, the other thing to notice in this case is that we couldn't design them all at the same time. We had to do what was called virtually seating them. So on this, I had to design the second molar and then virtually seat it while it's milling and then the first molar and then the pre-molar. So they all had to be done at uh, separate times, which you know wasn't such a bad thing actually. We just had to do it and it, it was pretty efficient. Uh, it would have been really cool to know what that program could do on today's computers because that thing would have just been a uh, rocket, but uh, we were using old computers. Well, I mean, they were new back then. One of the interesting features that CERT could do even back then was what was called correlation. Good CERT trivia for you if you're a CERT nut like me. Correlation was the word for biocopy years ago. And with the red camera, you could do biocopy very easily. So this was a gentleman that had a porcelain fused metal crown that had to be replaced and it had it, it was an abutment for a removable partial denture. And all you had to do was scan it in and play the video game and tell it to remake it. And those things fit even, even way back then. It was very predictable and quite frankly a selling point on why even to get into CEREC because uh, this was obviously, and even today, a difficult process to retrofit an existing partial denture. Uh, it, <laughs> for my old CEREC users, you remember the software way back like 1.8, 2.0, somewhere in there. The uh, the background was dark gray or this kind of a light gray and it was, just wasn't very... Uh, it wasn't a very exciting program to look at, but it was functional. And uh, even on this case, that was probably like two images to take that. Uh, I, as soon as I got into Sarek, I started figuring out how am I going to do anteriors with this. And one of the things about Sarek at the time was uh, uh, not only were computers and the software developing, but also materials were coming around to where there was more options. You know, uh, in the 90s, really the only thing that was available was uh, Vita Mark 1. Maybe Vita Mark 2 started hitting the, the uh, market probably around 2000. Then uh, Ivo Clark Vivident came out with ProCAD, which was their Empress block. And 
one of the things that Vita came out with about 2003, 2004 was the Vita Trilux block, which I just, uh, it, I still use it today, or the Trilux Forte now. Awesome, just really nice layering. And uh, this patient's still a patient of mine. She's uh, still rocking her veneers. And again, virtually seating. So if you look at the, at the software progression, I had to do seven, virtually seated, design number eight, virtually seated, number nine, virtually seated, and 10. And what we, what we had to do back then, especially in the midline, you would virtually, well, you design one of the centrals and make the mesial surface too, slightly too wide and then virtually seat it and then do the next one, number nine in this case, and then make the contact really red so that they were pushing into themselves like this. So when they milled out, then you had to hand finish the midline. On the other contacts, you can kind of get away with that going right down 50-50, but on the midline, we had to put, design them into themselves so that uh, we could get a good uh, midline. So anyway, that was the red camera. I think, uh, let me move forward. Oh yeah, before I get to the uh, blue camera, let me go back. My laptop's uh, on fire. Okay, let me go over here. So this, uh, I've got some of my equipment here. This was uh, the good old fashioned red camera here. And it was a uh, good size. It um, actually fairly small. Uh, the blue camera, which is the next one I wanna talk about slightly bigger but it had the same glass housing to it and then we had these little um, sleeves that would go on top of it I don't know if you remember but um, um, Rich Masick was a famous dentist from San Diego he made these little sleeves these little covers that went onto it so that uh, it was something you could rest onto it so the way these were actually utilized let me try to get it lined up so you would, you would elevate, let's say my fingers where the teeth would be, you would elevate it and then you would drop it and just touch the teeth. And then you'd have to kick the button, which, let me get this out of the way. The, uh, the button is way down at the bottom. And I know they're on the current versions of Sarek. It was because of these cameras. We, we had to kick the button to activate it. And quite frankly, Prime scan, even the Omnicam, we don't need the button down there anymore. It's kind of a vestigial, fancy word, vestigial uh, remnant of old red camera days. All right, let me get back here. Yeah, love doing, love doing anteriors. They were, they were tough. A lot of good uh, discussions back in the day on Dental Town on how to do anteriors with the red camera. Lots of fun. Then the big advancement was the blue camera and you know this was this was a really good system uh, I'll show a video here in just a second on how how it actually worked but basically uh, the red camera wasn't really red light it was an infrared which the wavelength was a lot larger and then the blue camera used blue wavelength because blue is the smallest visible wavelength and so the smaller the wavelength the more um, data and more precision the, the the smaller the data could actually be seen and uh, back in the day when the blue camera came out there were other manufacturers like uh, e4d that was trying to compete and they were using uh, lasers but they were using red so the the frequencies weren't as tight as what the blue camera is in fact for my current prime scan owners, what color is that light coming out of the camera? Yep, it's blue. So uh, there's something to blue wavelength of light. Uh, this was a case we obviously did with the blue camera. Uh, if for my owners out there uh, that you had blue camera, we, this was still powdered base, which you'll see in a minute, but at least the software started to turn blue. And in fact, with the uh, good trivia on this, the, even with the red camera, there was a period in time where the blue background came out and it, nobody knew any different other than the background change. So it looked a little bit fancier, but it was a precursor to the blue camera that was coming out. So everything was kind of in this blue theme. Uh, virtually seat that and then uh, this was Emacs so Emacs came out about 2005 or 6 somewhere around there blue cameras around 2007 um, we were beta testing both of them and so these are some of the earliest uh, 
Emacs restorations that have been made. And what I loved about the blue camera is that uh, the precision was just really good. If you had your uh, preps down, your isolation down, it was really dry and you powdered just ever so lightly, man, that blue camera would pick it up so fast and uh, you could get a lot of imaging done really well uh, and, and efficiently. Another thing that we couldn't do very well is um, in the red camera and the blue camera, like if there were two rectangles, the rectangles had to overlap like this and overlap and overlap. It had a really hard time if the overlap started to get to be angled. So that's, that's the hard thing because, you know, going around the arch and angling them, uh, sometimes it wouldn't uh, stitch. And there were all sorts of tricks on using jigs and all sorts of things. I used many of them, uh, especially seven through 10. We used to make a jig where we could just come straight across their teeth. In fact, in our training courses, I used to say, uh, you're gonna come across like you're cutting their throat. It was just a horrible way of saying it, but it was just a way to know that you weren't coming around the arch. You were trying to stay straight. So a little bit of limitations, uh, obviously in the stitching of that, but as far as precision goes, the x-rays looked spectacular. As long as the powdering was done correctly and the imaging was done correctly at the same time. The problem with uh, some users, especially in the blue camera days, was that they it was such a good camera, but they were rotating it a lot. And the more you would rotate and the more images you would take, it would average the model out. So the the more you were imaging, the, the more muddied the model would become. But intuitively, a human would think, well, the more I'm giving it, uh, it should be better. And that wasn't the case uh, back then. So this uh, lovely blue camera, let's uh, watch a little video I made years ago. It's a light dusting of that, uh, the spray. And then what you do is you'd hover it, and then as soon as you got it lined up down the path of draw of the preparation, you'd set it down, and then it would automatically click. So there's the first picture, and then you have to overlap about 15 to 30%. So there's a fourth image right there. So within four images, we got that amount of data. Now, <laughs> I, I was uh, showing my assistant Cindy this video uh, earlier today, and she said, you mean that's it? That's all you had to do? And I, I was like, yeah, that's all we had to do because if we did too much, then we'd mess things up. And so knowing what we do now with the prime scan and the Omnicam, you know, I'll tell, most, tell you right now, most people that are using the prime scan or the Omnicam are imaging way too much. You don't have to. So if you look at that model right there, we only had to capture the mesial of the molar to make the contact to it. We'd have to capture the whole molar. We'd have to capture around the distal buccal area because it didn't give us any information for the restoration that we were making. And then as far as mesially going on that, that model up there, you know, we, I only did that just so we could do like maybe the buccal bite with it, which was part of the blue camera history. That's when the buccal bite came out. Uh, the red camera did not have buccal bite. We used to have to use uh, bite registration material, which was a disaster. But anyway, going back to the size of the model, it, think about how fast the prime scan could image this little quadra and get it done. Why do you need any more information? You don't. So make your model smaller. You can get done even, even quicker. Uh, this was, uh, uh, the, you know, what I'd say about the blue camera, well, let me go back to the red camera. The red camera was a really good uh, single unit device. Like you could make single units very quickly and efficiently as long as you had the techniques down. And with the higher resolution camera, the blue camera, when it came out, it was easier to do quadrants, like doing multiple units. And plus we didn't have to virtually seat anymore during the evolution of the blue camera software. So it was easier to do quadrants like this. We could uh, take both of those crowns off, uh, get them prepped and imaged. And one of the things that had to happen a lot in uh, powdering days was we had to expose the margin really well. And I'm looking at that, that model right now going, Todd, are you sure? <laughs> Is that, was that exposed enough? 
I mean, it, it was tough. It wasn't the easiest thing to do, but you had to get the ledge so that Sarek could see that very defined ledge. So played the video game back then and not colored based, of course, just the blue background, yellow model. Uh, Emacs was live and kicking, so it's pretty much the same process that we have now. I'm not sure why I made the mesial contact so pointy, but I don't know. I'm not sure why, but I did it. I, even back then, the uh, with the uh, buckle bite, with the buckle bite, you know, you can, we could dial in the occlusion really well. I mean, it was very defined. In fact, you can see the marks on the model comparing to the marks of the um, uh, the human and the restorations were very predictable and you got what you designed. It was um, very accurate. In fact, all of my veneers, um, all my veneers and crowns and everything that James Clem did, thank you, James, my good friend, all of it done with the, the blue camera years ago and they fit good. My margins are awesome. One thing that was uh, also great was that uh, the evolution of materials as well. So this was a canine that we had to um, get a, I, I, you know what, I did the root canal on this, believe it or not. I don't, this may be the last root canal I ever did. <laughs> I used to do, I don't do root canals anymore. I, um, I probably should, that didn't look like a hard one to do. But uh, anyway, you could basically, we would do the root canal while the crown was milling, which was kind of a fun way to do it, it was very productive. But uh, Empress uh, became, uh, was the next one after ProCAD from Ivoclar Vivida, and then they came out with their multi-block, which was uh, you know our transitioned uh, polychromatic block from uh, Ivoclar Vivida, uh, the multi-block. And this was one of the first cases with it. It, it was a lot more aesthetic, it was really good for um, uh, transition of translucency, but still having a little bit more opacity to the case. But again, t take a look at that model. You see, it's just like two teeth uh, on the adjacent of that canine. That's all we had to do to get our restorations. Oh, and good old Galileus uh, in 2008, I believe, or nine, I can't remember which year, uh, we bought Galileus and just an amazing technology. And that was kind of the cool thing about how Serona was growing. Uh, as a company, they were, you know, they had such great uh, intuition about what the market was going to do, and they had such great engineers that they could work together. And they got a CT scanner that had very low radiation, and you could combine the the data from from Seric software, which which we all take advantage of today. But back then, it was such a great leap in dental technology, and so Serena was definitely driving the market in that regard. Uh, and before I show this, let me go back here. So uh, next camera, this, that was the blue camera. And you'll see that the, the housing and everything was pretty much the same as the red camera. The red camera was slightly smaller. I mean, not much, it, like when I'm holding these next to each other, the red camera is slightly smaller, but basically the lengths and the weights were about the same. They both had the little heating element right here and then also here. Uh, and then we had, this was another big issue that I remember uh, when we were doing training back then with the blue camera, people were not using these. And so what would happen is the, the glass would scrape along the powder and pick up powder on the glass. So if you have a blue camera, you should use one of these sleeves and when you buy them they they have this little lip to it right here and it's flat what we always did is we always polished it back so it kind of a rounded point right in the very middle that way when it's sitting on a tooth with the point you could kind of rotate it a little bit you don't need to do too much because that it and again with these uh, powdered cameras the red camera and the blue camera rotation is not good at all. It needs to stay in the same plane as you're pulling it across the teeth. But anyway, good little information there. All right. There's Mr. Gallows. Oh, and then the lovely Omnicam came out. I will never forget. 
2012 when it when it launched and uh, me and uh, James Clem and Paul Homily we were lecturing around the country talking about the great attributes of it because we didn't need powder no powder everyone was so excited no powder color based and I'm telling you what it was a blast to use that Omnicam this case I'm getting ready to show you you'll see how it struggles on some shiny areas but there, I, there isn't anybody that converted from a blue camera to Omni would, that would have gone back. Um, it had some issues. I mean, uh, today it's not quite so bad. The software has gotten a lot better, but had a hard time seeing very shiny metal. And sometimes you had to take a little bit of the powder and give it some dusting. And um, anyway, it, it was a great advancement. I think everybody would agree. So this was a case that we did in the beta testing. And what was neat about this particular case is that that very sub gingival distal margin I, I lasered it back and had i powdered it that margin would have just been disappeared it just would have been coated wouldn't have been able to have been seen and so in the Ceric software uh in the omnicam because it's a color base you know we can see the difference and it's much more manageable to do sub gingival restorations that was the biogeneric calculation, which came out. Uh, when did the biogeneric calculation come out? Though I'm going to guess that was about 2005 or six. Somebody can correct me on that. Mathematical calculation of dental anatomy, Emacs, of course, and then um, that finished. One of the problems to t back then when it came out and even to today is because the camera is so appealing and just so much fun to use, people would use it way too much. So even in this case, doing a single unit didn't really have to do more than a little bit of the adjacent teeth, but you know, we imaged the whole quadrant because we could. So don't image too much. Uh, this was a case that uh, you'll see some live imaging on the uh, with the Omnicam. We had some old amalgams, and this was uh, a case I used in our our onlay course. And so, let me get rid of these pictures. So the Omnicam, while we're waiting for anesthetic, just as you're watching this uh, image, you know you had to be fairly slow and like the meat let's you can see some bubbles on it having a little bit of hard time seeing through the bubbles and uh, you had to have really dry in fact in our omnicam training courses i used to always say it should be 90 degrees to the surface as much as possible so your assistant should be drying uh, the area and we always do it to where both of us are watching one really cool thing with the Omnicam, this, this came out during the Omnicam days, was uh, you could like cut and paste. So you could drag one over and then copy the uh, data over and then cut it out and then fill in what you needed to fill in. The blue camera and the red camera days, we couldn't do this. We had to drag and drop individual images in each catalog, and that's how we'd get uh, consistent data through there. But the... Uh, Good old Omnicam, still still love it. I had to use it the other day. I, I had a, a hard drive problem with my Prime Scan, and I had to pull out one of my Omnicams. And you know what? It ripped those two restorations right out. It did take me a little bit longer to to image, but it was it was a good time. Good times. All right, where are we at now? Oh, I was going to show. Let me go back here. I was going to show the Omnicam, of course, and you know, if you've never seen an Omnicam, it's small. I mean, one of the really, or, or, there we go. One of the neat things about it was the tip was just so small and the, and the, the shank or whatever you call this part uh, was really narrow and, and very light. The disadvantage to this versus the prime scan and the prime scan here, let me get my prime scan. I got too many Ceric machines here. Okay, so here's the lovely Prime Scan now. Obviously, the Prime Scan is much larger. It's kind of in the same um, uh, uh, design contours and everything. But you know, you would think that the Omnicam can reach areas better than the Prime Scan just because of the size. Uh, that's kind of true, but the thing is, the net result. This has a harder time 
seeing, let's say, around corners, even though that light can't bend around corners. This, you almost have to get 90 degrees. So uh, it's hard to get the distal of second molars. Whereas this one, although larger and a little bit heavier, it doesn't have to be like 90 degrees and it's much more efficient imaging. So getting the distal of second molars is actually a lot easier with this one because it happens so quickly. The Omnicam could be done, but there were tricks to get around um, the limitations of the angulation of the light on that. So Omnicam is super great. It, it would be really good if the prime scan could be in the size of one of these. And I'm, you know, they're probably working on it. It's probably going to be reality one day where um, we have a camera that's even smaller and gets that, that kind of resolution. And so to talk about that for a minute, where are cameras going in the future? First of all, I don't know. I mean, I have no uh, inside knowledge of this. And if I did, I couldn't tell you people on what it is. But this is my guess. I think that if we take, I'm going to go back to this, our lovely prime scan, which is super awesome. I predict that the cameras will start to turn the, the the use of them will start to go back to old school dentistry like full arch impressions. Uh, hang on one second. <laughs> Sorry, I had to pause my video. I had a cough. Sorry. Uh, but full arch impressions. So like right now we have to scan around and we, we take all the imaging. But what if the next generation of cameras, you put it in over the quadrant and then it just imaged the whole quadrant in all angles. It's scanned it in by itself instead of us having to move it all around and all the um, algorithms and calculations of all of the frame rates and everything that it has to calculate. It would be kind of cool if it was just in, takes the quadrant, in, takes the anterior sextant, and then this sextant. Or eventually, maybe in, our, in my clinical lifetime, that would be really cool, you take an old-fashioned impression tray and it just goes right over the arch and then it does all the scanning. So you just have to hold it in there and it scans, beeps, it comes out, and then it, the models are made. You know, I think that's probably what's going to happen. When that'll happen, I have no idea, but I hope I'm around to see that occur, because that would be really cool.